Rabbi Simon taught that the world stands on three things, justice, truth, and peace, as it says, execute the judgment of truth, justice, and peace in your gates, quoting Zechariah. Although Rabbi Shimon reverses the order of justice and truth, I believe that the prophet Zechariah had it correct. Truth has to go first. Justice is dependent on truth, and without justice, there can be no peace in the world. Very soon after this past fall's election, as Rabbi Shimon and Zechariah's words reverberated within me on an almost daily basis, I knew that as a synagogue, we were morally bound to reverently embrace and embody the words of our forebears. And as Reformed Jews, we are doubly bound, for our Judaism is a Judaism of the Enlightenment and glorifies the Enlightenment's own passion and search for truth. This morning's discussion, therefore, is a must for the American synagogue today. And I wanted Temple Micah to foster this conversation. And I knew that it would be very easy to find the journalist to make it happen. I needed just to stand in the lobby for a couple of weeks and invite these fine people as they walk through the door. So thank you, Jody, Naftali, Dana, and Elizabeth for being here this morning. Thank you for what you do, and thank you also for being part of Temple Micah. I'll introduce Jody, who will, in, who will in turn introduce the rest of the panel. Jody is the assistant managing editor for CNN Politics and was the editor of CNN's book on the 2016 presidential race, Unprecedented, the election that changed everything. Although we know Jody is past president of the congregation and as a dear friend, Outside of these walls, Jody is a nationally known award-winning journalist specializing in politics and policy who has covered the White House, Congress, and presidential campaigns. She's former president of Journalism and Women's Symposium and a graduate of the University of Illinois and a Washington Nationals fan. <laughs> Finally, I'd like to note that this morning's event marks the very first project that is being funded by our Temple Micah Innovation Fund. Thank you, Rabbi Zemmel. First, uh, on the far end, we have Dana Milbank. Dana is a nationally syndicated op-ed columnist with the Washington Post. I'm sure most of you have read and uh, chuckled along or been horrified by his columns. <laughs> his column generally appears four times a week in the Post and in 275 other newspapers. Dana provides political commentary on TV and radio outlets, and he's the author of three books on politics. Before joining the Post, Dana was a senior editor at the New Republic, where he covered the Clinton White House with me, uh, and um, was a reporter for the Wall Street Journal, where he covered Congress and was a London-based correspondent. And he's about to get married. Elizabeth Miller is the Washington bureau chief of the New York Times. As a Times correspondent, she's covered the Pentagon, John McCain's 2008 presidential campaign, and the White House, a beat she began on, get this, September 10th, 2001. During her five years covering the Bush administration, Elizabeth also wrote a weekly column called White House Letter about people and behind the scenes events of the presidency. Earlier in her career, Elizabeth worked for the Washington Post in Washington, New Delhi, Tokyo, and New York. And she also is the author of three books. And then next to me is Naftali Ben-David. He's an editor in the Wall Street Journal's Washington Bureau and formerly spent many years at the Chicago Tribune. He also has covered the White House, Congress, and the courts, and did a stint in Brussels covering the European Union. Naftali was a longtime regular guest on the Diane Reem Show and now appears regularly on 1A with Joshua Johnson. So welcome to all of you and thank you so much for being here. So I'd like to start by talking about this whole question of post-truth. When Rabbi Zemel said, to me, let's, we want to do a panel on post, the post-truth era. I thought, wait a minute, we're still trying to tell the truth. What's this all about? So I did some reporting on it and found out that uh, the Oxford Dictionary 
uh, declared that post-truth was the word of the year in 2016. They said that use of the word post-truth increased by approximately 2,000% over its usage in 2015 and attributed that to Brexit and the US presidential race. Here is how the Oxford English Dictionary defines post-truth. They say it's an adjective relating to or denoting circumstances in which objective facts are less influential in shaping public opinion than appeals to emotion and personal belief. Interestingly, they, they don't define it as after the truth. They, they talk about it as belonging to a time in which this concept is unimportant or irrelevant. So I'd like to start by asking the panelists if you agree that we're in a post-truth era, and if so, in what way? So why don't I start with you, Naftali? I mean, to me, that would be a little bit too sweeping to talk about this being a post-truth era. One thing that occurs to me is, if I'm not mistaken, I think the circulation of all of our publications jumped right after Donald Trump was elected. And to me, that says that there's still a great number of people, I would, without proof, uh, think it's a majority of the people who are still very interested in verifiable, confirmed facts and the kind of work we do where nothing we report hasn't been carefully ascertained and vetted and, and edited and, and, and scrutinized. Um, so. Uh, to me, that sounds too sort of grand to talk about this being a post-truth era. I mean, that said, I do find it a little bit disturbing or disconcerting that there does seem to be a certain segment of the population and a certain number of the leaders of uh, various factions uh, that are, I think, all too willing to discount facts that either come from sources that they don't like or that make them uncomfortable and don't fit into their worldview and the way they like to see things. Uh, so I do find that a, I guess, disconcerting phenomenon uh, even while I guess I still have faith that there's large numbers and majorities of people who still really want to find out the reality as it is. And uh, you raise an interesting point that people now often look to publications, websites, television stations with which they agree. And they often now are in more of a bubble than in the old days when there were three networks and everybody read the newspaper. So Elizabeth, do you find that that changes the way we in the main, what we call the mainstream media, do our jobs and does it, does it do damage to what we're trying to do? Sure, I mean, I, first of all, I'd like to say that I think any political campaign uh, is part of, the, a part of a post-truth era because a lot of, most political campaigns appeal to emotions and, and passions. So we saw it on steroids in this last election, obviously. But it certainly it's changed the way we do things at the New York Times. We have just employed a full-time fact check writer. I mean, you've had one for a long time. But we have a, we have a stable now, but we have per, a person in the Washington Bureau. She came from PolitiFact. And she writes three, four times a week. I mean, just, and we're trying to now actually, because we focus so much on Donald Trump and the Republicans, we're trying to try and focus a little bit on the Democrats, but the Republicans are, are keeping us very busy. So we've changed the way we do things. Um, we have also changed, um, I could just briefly, uh, we have done twice now in headlines and in, in, in lead stories in the Times written that the president lied, which is a new, uh, new road for us. In the past, if we would say the president uh, uh, you know, uh, uttered a falsehood or it was inaccurate, but it was a decision made by the executive editor, Dean Baquet, in New York that there were two, two cases. The first was when the president continued to say that Obama was, born, was not born in the United States. And so the decision was made that this was so, um, he had done it so often, uh, it was so sustained over such a long period of time, and it was uh, against all evidence that it was time to call it a lie. The same, we did the same thing more recently when the president said that three million people had voted illegally in 2016 in the election. And again, that was a decision made in New York. It was a sustained uh, assertion over a long period of time, and we just called it like that. So that's very different. So, so tell us a little bit about how you deal with um, what a, lo a lot of us can only sometimes call a lie. Um, we, we've used all kinds of euphemisms, falsehoods, evidence-free, uh, baseless, and these kinds of descriptions. But you, you, you cut right to the chase. 
How has your life changed? Well, I'm here because they needed somebody on this panel to defend Donald Trump. <laughs> so, and that's what I'm going to do and say I disagree with the New York Times decision to say he's lying. I don't think he is. Um, and let me explain why. Um, I, did a, I did a piece on this uh, um, but very early in the administration. Uh, I think it was the, that Saturday or Sunday after the inauguration. He was talking to the uh, CIA, and he said, you know, he's given this inaugural speech, and there were some drops of rain. He's like, oh no, this is going to be bad. And he said, and then the rain stopped, and there was bright sunshine. So I was there, like 20 feet from him, and it was raining on me. <laughs> so um, so I, I got in touch with the, the Capitol Weather Gang at the Washington Post for some satellite imagery. Um, and the, the, you know, the rain maps and the weather maps to see that, no, there was un, unbroken cloud cover you know, from here to West Virginia during, during that, that period of time. Um, and then there was also a 360-degree uh, you know, camera, so you could actually look at the sky through the entire speech, which I did also. Um, <laughs> uh, but I think what this shows is that it's not to lie, it means, first of all, it has to be untrue. And second of all, uh, you have to know it's untrue. And I'm concerned that uh, the president doesn't think he's lying because he believes what he's saying when he's saying it. Uh, and his biographer, who did the, uh, or the, the guy who did the art of the deal with him, said that you know, more than any human being he's ever met, uh, Donald Trump has the ability to believe that whatever the last thing to come out of his mouth is true, or at least ought to be true. Um, so I think that's the difficulty in saying it's a lie because I, I think it's worse than that and that is I think um, uh, that he doesn't actually uh, think he's lying. This shows how circumstances have changed for us in ways that we never envisioned. I mean, we always have to make these calls. I think all of us do when the president says something or people close to him or other well-placed individuals that seems untrue or wildly implausible or has no evidence to back it up. We have to figure out how to frame it because we do try to be careful. And so I happened to be working on Saturday when there was the tweet about President Obama having wiretapped him and he being a sick and bad person. And it seemed wildly implausible. It didn't seem like it could be true. The president can't individually order wiretaps of people. So it had to have been some kind of incredible conspiracy for this to be correct. But there we were. It's hard to prove a negative you know, in the 10 minutes you have before the story has to go online. So you're trying to craft things like you know, unsubstantiated and without evidence and explaining how the system really works. And do you say widely discredited or do you say false? And at what point is it OK to sort of change the adjective? So um, I mean, we have endless deliberations within the newsroom uh, in an attempt to get it exactly right and to sort of frame what's been said with what, you know, against what we know to be true. And particularly if the assertion has been repeated in the face of contrary evidence, you know, how do you frame that? And it's just not something we've ever really had to deal with in journalism before. And you at the Journal also have a standard having to do with intent, do you not? Well, th so this is the lie thing has come up. And I, I don't, I, in a way, I don't, like, I don't think we should put too much emphasis on this debate about whether or not you use lie or you don't. We're all trying to make the best calls we can. I think you know, um, our editor sort of felt like that was a level of intentionality that we didn't want to get into, that if we say that something is false and it's been repeated you know, in the face of contrary evidence, our readers can figure out whether they're smart enough to figure out whether they think you know, it was a lie or it wasn't a lie. But, but I think the broader point is just that we're all trying to wrestle with how to frame uh, you know, you know, the these situation where people in the White House in senior positions are saying things that just seem to be contrary to the evidence. And, but you know, if we're talking about a post-truth era, you know, it isn't just the White House. I mean, there's this whole conspiracy group out there that thinks that Sandy Hook, this massacre of these children at elementary school, was a hoax. You know, there's the Comet Pizza thing. I mean, I think, I think this is sort of a broader issue than just what's going on at the White House. Um, we now have a president who has described journalists as enemies of the American people and whose staff has described us as the opposition. So my question to you is, how do reporters deal with that kind of um, diatribe, and how does that affect coverage? Um, Naftali, do you want to start? Yeah, I mean, I think, 
I think there's something particular going on here. And in some ways, I think Bannon's comment about us being the opposition party is almost more telling than the president's comment about us being enemies of the American people. Because I think there's an attempt, you know, we see ourselves, and maybe this is a little bit self-aggrandizing, but we see ourselves as being nonpartisan, not having an agenda. We're not trying to get legislation passed. We're not trying to win an election. We're trying to scrutinize not just both parties, but everyone, all parties, all sources of power, and put them under the same kind of spotlight. And I think there's a group of people that want to make us combatants in the political arena, just like everybody else. There's the Democrats, the Republicans, you know, the Green Party, there's the press, just as though we're sort of part of the battle. And I think it's really important for us to resist that, uh, because I think we need to maintain our role as people who do try to scrutinize everyone, try to confirm facts as best we can. We're not trying to spin things. We're, uh, now, we make mistakes. I mean, I, I feel like sometimes in these conversations, it can come off as though, you know, we think we're perfect, and very, very far from that. But at least our goal is to try to put everybody under the same kind of scrutiny and get it all right. And, and I, I just, you know, I think there's an, so that kind of language, I think, is an attempt to shift the landscape in a way that, that, we, that we have to resist. Um, so I, I thought I'd also introduce into the discussion the notion that I don't think we're necessarily post-truth. I think we're, the truth is just on a holiday. Uh, right now, and, and, and it'll come back at some point. There was a Quinnipiac University poll last month. Uh, no reason to think it would change. If you look overall at the country, I think it was, I may be making this up, this may be fake news, but it's, it's, <laughs> it's pretty close. Um, like 52% said they believe the news media more than Donald Trump. And 37% said they believe Donald Trump more than news media. So that's the, so it's 37% of the country that's sort of the Alex Jones, Grassy Knoll uh, crowd here, which is larger than we ever thought. But if you look at it by party, 78% uh, of Republicans believe uh, Donald Trump uh, more than the news media. So how does that change? Because they're not 78% of Republicans aren't crazy. Um, uh, so that's, it's sort of a partisan reflex response to defend the president. But what hap what will happen is uh, people begin to see with their own eyes that it's not true. It's not, it won't be somebody's word against another. You know, you'll, uh, over time, you'll see that uh, he's not bringing coal jobs back to West Virginia and manufacturing back to the Midwest. And I think that's when truth returns from uh, its long sojourn that it is now on. And I just want to say they, they obviously need us as an opposition party. It's really important. He doesn't have a, 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 a opponent right now. He's got the Democrats, but he doesn't have uh, somebody. He's not running against anybody right now, and he needs that. And we're pretty good. We're a good target. And uh, it's as you know, as we all know, in many ways, <laughs> yes, we're the enemies of the people. We're the opposition party. Uh, they all, he all, they're very accessible to us. Uh, they call us a lot. Yes. Uh, Trump called the New York Times and the Washington Post on, on Friday. His first calls to, to spin that, oh, it was all the Democrats' fault. He called our reporters. Mm -hmm. So uh, you just we need to know the reality. They're, Steve Bannon, the whole gang in there, extremely accessible. Uh, so if, they, if, we're the, you know, if we're the fake news media, they're certainly treating us somewhat seriously. And there's another point, yeah. which is that they're, they're happy to attack us when they don't like things we report, but they're just as quick to cite us when we right. report something that yeah, fits into the message too. they're trying to make. You see them quote you know, the New York Times on a regular basis if it fits into the message they're trying to put out there. But, but to sort of add a layer to what Elizabeth is saying, you know, it's true that every president, no, I don't know if a president ever liked the press. That just doesn't seem to be the way things work, and it's probably not the way Things should work, um, but but he has this. But this current president has an added mechanism, which is Twitter, so that he doesn't need us to get out his message in the same way that previous presidents have. And and I mean, I looked at his feed the other day. I think he has got like 27 million followers. I mean, we're one of the, we're one of the biggest papers in the country. We have like two million subscribers. I mean, so it gives you a sense of, of the scope. And I think there's an, a way in which, even though he does deal with us all the time, he also feels that he has this completely different, unfiltered way of getting his message out, at least to his followers. The thing that I worry about is, during some point when the truth uh, is still on holiday, that there is some, uh, a crisis, like God forbid, a huge terrorist attack. Uh, and then all this, so we've sort of been laying this predicate that you can't believe anything out there. And so when there is this crisis, uh, and he uh, comes out and makes up some story about who's responsible as a justification for saying, you know, rounding up all Muslims in America, that's when 
that's what I'm af af afraid of occurring. It's not the, you know, the, the, the stuff we've been hearing so far about the, the, the wiretapping or the, uh, the size of the inauguration crowd or the, the people voting illegally. I mean, th I think that's all preparing for something uh, that could happen that's, that's much larger. And that's what's, that's what's scary, not what's happened so far. So do you think there's something that the media should be doing to guard against that, to prepare, oh. to make sure that we can get the truth I, out? No, I just, I mean, I don't, we're not, uh, you know, doing some sort of advocacy. We just got to keep doing our jobs. And, uh, you know, we're not out there to do a campaign. So uh, we're not, we never defend ourselves. One of the, the there was this great, uh, Protest signed, you know, right after the inauguration, said, "Fact checkers of the world unite." <laughs> it's like, oh, what are we going to do? <laughs> I mean, do we do? There's do, things we, small things we do different. Well, big things that uh, we do differently. Uh, you know, recently, I can't remember what Trump had said. What was it? He had said that, uh, oh right, that undocumented um, uh, workers, you know, uh, the undocumented create, uh, were responsible for more crimes than anybody else. That's false. And so I, I held up the story until we had, we, we had our, we, you know, called on our fact checker just to insert a line in the story saying actually studies show that native born Americans are, you know, uh, commit more crimes. And I just, you know, so you have to be vigilant against that kind of stuff. You just don't want, um, you know, his uh, statements to go unadulterated into, the, into, the, into print when they're absolutely false. So One thing that he's been quite good at is when we are writing these stories and things aren't looking so good for him, he manages to change the subject, often with an early morning tweet. Elizabeth, you mentioned that the, um, the White House still does talk to the New York Times and all of the publications here, um, that the president did call you on Friday. His staff also talks to everybody. It's, every president rails about leaks, and every White House leaks. This one seems to leak an awful lot. <laughs> um, even as the president talks about these anonymous sources who don't actually exist. We know they do exist. Yeah, they're down the hall from him, right? Right. So, but some people in the White House, in addition to the president, have talked in, in falsehoods. Right. Um, so how do you deal with those people? Do you continue to talk to those people? Do you treat them any differently? Well, we, we're, we're much, we're really careful. It's really hard. You get. Uh, you know, you can ask the same question of two very senior staff members, this happens with our White House correspondents, and you get completely opposite answers. And who is lying? You know, who's got a knife out for who? It's very hard to, to discern. Uh, uh, it's, it's much harder to report. There's a lot of factions inside the White House right now, more than we're used to. There's, um, it's much more, there's much more warfare between the staff. And so you just have to, um, we do a lot of reporting. And sometimes it's just, on one hand, someone's saying this, the other person's saying that. You know, it's, it's just really hard to know what's going on in there. I can think of one thing more. It happens just this over this weekend. There was something we were chasing, and um, we checked it out. I can't get into it, but it, let me tell you something. It was, <laughs> you, you, check it, you, you check it with the FBI, you check it around with other parts of the administration. You definitely have to be super careful. I'd like to talk for a minute about Trump supporters. The media were roundly criticized and criticized themselves after the election for failing to capture the mood of the country, failing to understand why people were supporting Donald Trump. And um, a lot of those people continue to support Donald Trump. And I'm wondering, um, we all work for organizations that often are called the elite media. Um, how you try to change that, how you try to make sure you're adequately and accurately reflecting what's really going on in the country. Well, we now, we now, <laughs> I, you know, the, um, we now go out more, much more often to parts of the country where there's a lot of Trump supporters and talk to them. Those stories tend to have, until recently, they've tended to have the same, they're the same story over and over again, that when, no matter what he does, we love him. You know, there's a certain one note aspect to these stories. Um, and I think more recently, we're seeing that people are saying, well, 
you know, I really like my health care. Let me see what he really does. Or, you know, I don't know. You know, so you're getting a little bit of that. So we are just paying more attention. But, um, uh, you know, the, I don't know that the answer is going out to Louisiana every every two weeks and talking to people who love Donald Trump and aren't following the news that much. I mean, also, I mean, there's always a danger in these situations that you sound defensive. But I mean, we all sent people out to Trump country constantly during the campaign. And we, they were all, I mean, in fact, the stories were even parodied at some point because yeah. you'd go to some little town <laughs> I know, I know. where Main Street was boarded up and the factory had closed and you'd quote some person about how <laughs> angry they were and how they were going to vote for Trump. And, um, you know, clumsy as it may have been, there were, I think, plenty of attempts we all made. Now, we got the election wrong, and I certainly wouldn't want to sugarcoat that, and uh, so did everybody else. I mean, I would argue that the Trump campaign didn't think they were going to win, um, and that is something that really requires well, actually, some... actually, can I just interject? We, the, the, the polls were right. Right. Hillary Clinton won by two percentage points with the popular vote. Do you think we missed another story, or perhaps underplayed another story, which had to do with Russia? During the campaign, I mean the 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 Clinton the Clinton campaign um, did try to get all of us to spend more time focusing on the role of Russia and hacking John Podesta's emails and the DNC's emails. It, it was written about, but it was never really elevated uh, to a particularly high level. Um, what what do you all think, Elizabeth? What I do you think? think well, about we that? were we were um, involved in both stories. Um, the Russia story uh, became clear much later in the campaign. That's the, that's the, that's the truth. In September, uh, there was this, we've written about it so I can talk about it. There was, there was the FBI was alarmed over this back channel between, supposed back channel between the Alpha Bank in Moscow and the Trump Organization in New York. Uh, we spent weeks on that, weeks and weeks and weeks, and looking at it. Um, and the FBI cooled to it after a while, and ultimately, if you don't know what it is, which we didn't, and now they, they, they now we're not sure what it was, and it doesn't seem to be what we thought it was, or the FBI thought. So yeah, we we um, and the, I know the Democrats are going to be furious about this forever, but um, <clears throat> we just didn't have the facts to go with the big story on that at the time. And um, and again, the the Clinton email investigation began much the summer before 2015. <clears throat> Uh, it was a criminal investigation, um, and uh, it played out over a much longer period of time. And the Russian investigation got going much later, and we were, didn't know about it until much later. So yes, I can see the, um, the anger among the Democrats, um, but we were not, um, we, uh, I, I can assure you that we focused on it in, in Washington and wrote the, as much as we could, and we're still continuing, obviously, to write about it now. In addition to attacking news outlets, a lot of news outlets, um, the president, um, and, and as, particularly as a candidate, sometimes singled out individual reporters. Um, and there's been a lot of, there have been a lot of very nasty tweets, uh, racial, anti-Semitic, not by him, but by um, readers, viewers, uh, attacking these reporters. It seemed to have created this um, echo chamber of hatred, and I'm wondering if um, any of you are concerned either for your own safety or for those of other of your reporters, and have you had to take steps to protect them? Uh, uh, not so far. There have been a few things, but not so far, and it's, it's stopped since the campaign. Largely, we had a, um, an incident. There's been a couple with some of the... Um, uh, J Jewish reporters in the bureau, and but um, you know it goes. It starts on Twitter, and it gets very, very ugly. Mm -hmm. It gets really scary, but but then it abates. So right now we've done, we know we uh, we keep an eye on it. But the sad truth is, is this this is not a Trump phenomenon in the sense that there's been this concern about safety of the press for some time now, and we all were very aware of the Charlie Hebdo uh, incident in Paris, and we've certainly beefed up security over the years. I don't think we've beefed it up particularly because of what's happened in the last few months, but over time, it's something we've had to think about. Please characterize the sources who are providing quote unquote truths to the press from inside the Trump administration and the Republican Congress. Well, they're, they're very senior aides to the president and uh, uh, senior aides to people on the Hill. It, sources aren't doing it out of the goodness of their hearts. They have <laughs> agendas. They have a storyline they want to drive. What's going to happen with the Russia story? Does anyone want to take a stab at 
at that? Look, uh, nobody knows. Nobody knows what what the, the facts are, where or where it ends. What we did learn in the last week is that um, clearly Devin Nunes and the House Intelligence Committee aren't terribly interested in finding out about it. So, uh, and and probably. Uh, not much better in the Senate. So the real question is, it, you know, it's all on the FBI, which uh, uh, is led by a man who none of us can necessarily predict. Um, uh, I can't imagine there's going to be a special prosecutor. So uh, it's a, you know, it's, it's a real question of what comes out in, in the long run. Uh, we've got a big, and we've got an investigative team in the bureau now looking. We've been looking into this for a long time. Uh, I don't know where it's going to go. It could it could possibly take years because it's a counterintelligence investigation, it's not. And sometimes we, you never know what happens in those. Um, so I can't predict. Um, there is a lot there for reporters to look at, though. I can say that. So, so how do we get back to the pre-post-truth era? How do we get back to making sure that people know we are about the truth and getting a greater credibility back. Um, can, we get, can we get out of this post-truth uh, moniker? I mean, it's a hard thing to do. These, there's some pretty big social forces at work here that I think asking us how we can change, you know, it's, it's a tall order. I mean, beyond just trying to do the best we can, I, I have noticed this thing that where I think all of our organizations are trying to explain a little more what we do and how we do it. Yeah. Th thank you all so much, and I just want to repeat what Dana just said. Um, keep doing your jobs, and thank you from all of us for doing what you do. Thank you.